I'd like to start with something that a, a man called Danny once said. He said, I'd love to go out more to places such as the local pub and the library, but I'm frightened to do that in case I'm dangerous. I've never been dangerous, but you read about schizophrenics being dangerous all the time in the paper. So I thought that because I have schizophrenia, I'd be dangerous if I went out. And I don't remember exactly when I first read that, but I do remember that it had a profound effect on me. And it made me think about what it's like to have experiences when you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and how that affects people's beliefs, how it affects people's beliefs about the people that they know and trust but now feel that they can't trust, people they don't know and feel that they can't trust, and how it affects some of the experiences that people have, such as hearing voices, perhaps a voice that's providing a commentary about what other people are doing, what other people are saying, what they're thinking, and what you should be doing. And it made me think about how Danny, perhaps, trying to manage these confusing and distressing and disturbing feelings, didn't have the opportunity to make sense of those because of a conversation about those experiences around him. And instead, in the absence of those conversations, relied on the media and he looked out to the media, to the press and other media, to make sense of these experiences, and that what he had reflected back to him was an image of dangerousness. And that he took that image of dangerousness and he applied that to himself, despite the fact that he'd not been dangerous himself before, that he reinterpreted himself. And that this is something that we can think about in terms of a process called self-stigma, where people take negative social images and messages and they apply them and internalize them to themselves and how they understand their own lives and how that affects their understanding and their beliefs about themselves and their feeling about themselves. And this has, as I say, a profound effect on me and made me wonder about how accurate this was as an account of what the media and what the press were saying about mental health. And I was aware of um, some stark uh, examples, such as the example of the headline from the Sun newspaper, 12,000 killed by mental patients, which is a very stark example of an image of dangerousness. But I was curious about how, how uh, much this was an exception or to what extent this reflected something broader. So I decided to put together a study to examine this and I gathered uh, two years of newspaper uh, uh, articles within all of the popular press within the UK that wrote about schizophrenia. And at the same time, I gathered together two years, the same period, two years' examples of how the same papers had written about diabetes. And I did that deliberately because, as a comparison, diabetes isn't a mental health condition, it's a physical health condition. But at the same time, it is a condition where there are some elements of stigma because of the association of lifestyle, what people uh, eat, drink, level of exercise connected to diabetes. That there's some stigma around blaming. So I wanted to have a look to see how do the same papers in the same period write in different ways? What's the language that they use when they talk about these different issues? And I used a piece of software called AntConc to look at these two data sets to see what were the different characteristics and language that was used. And with some colleagues, uh, Professor Peter Kinderman from uh, Liverpool University and Anne Cook from um, Canterbury University, uh, we published this data. And the results were quite a clear pattern, really, of uh, types of language that we um, identified as being the paper's sort of signature of uh, linguistic signatures of violence. 
And if you look at, these are ordered, when we publish this, we order these by the relative frequency uh, of one uh, writing about schizophrenia and writing about um, diabetes. And if you focus on the, the most, relatively the most frequent words, the pattern's really quite clear. So there are words like murder, stabbed, killed, violent, horror, brutal, hammer, screwdriver, axe, schizophrenic, killer, attacker. So again, it made me think about Danny and how he had his own life experiences of not having been dangerous, but confronted with these messages, he'd reinterpreted his own life as somebody who was dangerous. And that had then impacted on his sense of how he was safe or not to be out among others. And that made me then curious about whether this was something specific to writing about schizophrenia. And before I became an academic, I'd worked in clinical practice for a decade, working with people with a diagnosis of personality disorder. And one of the striking things about um, people with a diagnosis of personality disorder is that there is a high proportion of people, perhaps 85%, who've experienced neglect and abuse in childhood and that those experiences translate directly into the types of experiences and difficulties that people have in adulthood. So that the lack of the experiences of neglect and abuse translate into a lack of trust in how they can assess whether other people are going to be benevolent and friendly whether, or whether their intentions are ones of harm. Further, it's a lack of trust in their belief that they can make an assessment of the sort of person that they are in quite a stark way, whether they are somebody who is good, whether they are somebody who is bad, and makes them vulnerable to accepting the definitions that other people around them make of them. So whether people around them say, you are creative, you are caring, or whether people around say, you are time-wasting, or manipulative, or dangerous, that people are vulnerable to accepting those definitions because of a lack of trust in their ability to make definitions for themselves. So I was curious about whether there was a similar pattern within the same papers about personality disorder. So I put together a study, a similar study, looking at the same popular press and how they'd written about personality disorder, and again, comparing that to how they'd written about diabetes, and looking at that over a 10-year period from 2008 to 2017. And I published that with um, a colleague, Professor uh, Andy Lovell. And the results are strikingly similar. So again, some of the key linguistic characteristics that come up are words like murder, killing, killed, violence, violent, wicked, knife, crossbow, knives, killer, evil, killers, psycho. So again, the evidence was really quite clear that there's a strong pattern of the way in which this popular press were presenting images and messages around both schizophrenia and personality disorder that emphasized the images of dangerousness um, that resonated with the, um, this initial sort of stimuli of this uh, man called Danny and his response. And I think it's worth taking a moment to, to remember that this isn't just about words, that actually this is about creating internal mental images as well. And it isn't just about our conscious life, but it's about how these strike at an unconscious level, how they create unconscious mental images in this instance of violence, how it creates unconscious and conscious emotional responses that then inform both consciously and unconsciously the decisions and behavior that we have, some of which is quite automatic, some of which is quite subtle, but that this had a power, as I said, 
in this instance with Danny, that despite his own personal experiences, that he'd redefined himself. And I want to take a slightly different tack now, because it is kind of quite clear that I am selecting some particular examples within the media, and that this isn't the whole picture. That actually the picture is a much more of a mixed bag. And so, you know, there have been lots of examples um, over the last few years of celebrities like Ruby Wax, Nicki Minaj, Dwayne Johnson, Stephen Fry, to name just a few, who have spoken about the significant challenges and difficulties that they've had with their own mental health and well-being. And I don't think it can be stressed too much how important that's been in changing a narrative within the press about mental health and increasing the acceptability of being able to speak about mental health and well-being. And that is so hugely important. But I do have two points. And one is that despite that being hugely important, we also shouldn't be complacent about the other reality of some of the messages that are there and the negative impact that this can have on people's lives. And my second point is that if I go back to sort of my image of what went on for Danny, and that it's the absence of people talking about these experiences that could have helped him make sense of what was going on, that instead meant that he reached out to the media, that that really is a key for an opportunity that we have that if we can speak openly and honestly about the rich diversity of experiences that are part of being a human being, then the media no longer have a monopoly on that narrative. Thank you. <laughs>